put some check marks on there. Thank you, uh, Chairman Handy, Brett McEntee, members of the committee. My name is Jonathan Gerard, the Rhode Island City Director for Clean Water Action. I also serve on the Executive Committee of the Environment Council of Rhode Island. Um, we are in support of this bill, Clean Water Action, and this is an active priority for, for this year, so just um, you know, be advised of that. Um, I did submit some uh, written testimony. Um, there are a couple tweaks to language, which I think uh, a lot of us here have some tweaks. Um, that are included in my written testimony, but I kind of just want to briefly talk about some of the problems associated with this. Um, uh, some of them have already been chatted about today, um, and then some of the benefits as well. And so um, I want to start off with the environmental problem, right? Because that's kind of, you know, this is the Environment Committee. So um, we do know that plastic pollutes the marine environment. That's no secret. We've heard it um, from our uh, Brett McEntee earlier. I'm sure we've seen it on our beaches, in our waterways, and stuff like that. Um, when these plastics make their way, and specifically we're talking about, you know, this bill uh, addresses um, single-use um, thin film plastic bags that are not reusable, and it, um, it uh, addresses polystyrene foam. And so when these things enter our waterways, either via stormwater drain or they blow out trucks or recycling bins, um, blow out of the, um, the landfill, uh, they end up in our waterways. They break down um, through sunlight and through wave action into things called microplastics. And this is like a new um, term that uh, the scientific community has really been struggling with uh, over the past decade or so. They've really um, seen a lot more microplastic pollution in our waters. A lot of the attention that's been paid to this has been uh, you know, focused on the big Pacific Ocean gyre and the Atlantic Ocean gyre and things like that. Um, this is actually a very global problem. Um, microplastics are in there against the bay. Um, they are just about marine creatures, they kill wildlife, they enter into the food chains we heard earlier. Um, uh, at the rate that we consume plastic products globally, um, a recent study came out that estimated that there will be more plastic by weight in the ocean by 2050 than marine by weight. Um, this past summer, uh, along with the uh, partners at Save the Bay and some others, um, Clean Water Action uh, did a check on microplastic pollution in there against the Bay to see if there was actually microplastic pollution. So we took 12 samples um, everywhere from Newport Harbor up to the Seekonk River. Um, and I brought some fun props um, to share with everyone. These are samples from there against the Bay from different parts. Pass them down. Um, you'll see uh, white pieces of plastic debris, that's thin film plastic. Um, there's big pieces of polystyrene foam. There's some rigid plastics and stuff like that. Um, really, really fun stuff, right? Um, we took 12 samples, we found microplastic pollution in all 12 samples. Um, it, was not, or it was not scientific, so we didn't have the um, types of plastic analyzed, we didn't have a, a specific count. All we wanted to do was see if there was microplastic. Um, and so there are other groups uh, like Save the Bay that have the scientific tools to do that type of sampling and that they are doing that now. There's some research being done in Google Rye as well. So this is something that's not just happening out in the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. This is stuff that's happening right here in Narragansett Bay. Um, and it has been, as has been talked about earlier, Narragansett Bay is the engine of our economy, right? Our tourism economy, our fishing economy, our boating economy, our recreation economy, and then there's the hospitality industry and the service economy that comes along with that, right? Um, all of those things tied together. And when our Narragansett Bay is filled with plastic pollution, um, you know, that puts all of those different industries at risk. Um, you know, there was a great quote that I wanted to share. We were out with uh, the Save the Bay Baykeeper. Uh, we pulled up a sample of, and it was full of larval crabs. And I know a lot of, including folks in this room, a lot of people have been working for many years to clean up Narragansett Bay. And it's a lot cleaner than it used to be. There's not as much nutrient pollution um, as there used to be. Um, but we started pulling apart all of those larval, larval crabs. We found microplastics all in there. And so that's the new problem that we're going to be facing. Um, especially as we ramp up the use of plastics in our society. Um, plastic pollution also involves heavy carbon emissions, right? So the, 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 the um, production and shipping of plastic is made from fossil fuels. It's an extractive industry. Here in Rhode Island, this body is very dedicated to reducing our carbon emissions and trying to meet the climate goals that we set for ourselves. Um, this helps um, getting rid of these items, um, helps towards that, that goal. Now, one of the arguments of the plastic bag industry is that Plastic bags are actually better for the environment because they create fewer emissions. That's true. So paper bags uh, do have four times the carbon footprint um, in production than plastic bags do. But they're biodegradable um, and um, they don't last in our oceans and in our neighborhoods for a thousand, a thousand years or more, essentially. 
Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. I mean, you know, this body has passed a number of different pieces of legislation to address climate, uh, the climate problem that we're facing. Um, this goes, helps us reach those goals. Um, single use plastics, as we heard, waste consumer dollars. So we've talked about a little bit about low income residents here and folks who are going to have to pay for plastic bags, uh, or well, actually paper bags and thicker reusable plastic bags. We already pay for those bags. And low income residents, to the richest person in Rhode Island, if they go to a store that isn't price right or Aldi or another that already charges for a bag, the cost of those bags are built in to the cost of the products in those stores. So even me, who is religious about bringing my uh, reusable bags to the store, um, I'm still paying for bags because I'm buying products in those stores. And so what a fee on paper and thicker reusable plastic does is two things. One, it is a transparent way of highlighting those costs for consumers. It gives consumers the option to buy the bag or to not. Um, the second thing it does is the fee incentivizes the consumer the behavior change we want to see. And so we're not going to incentivize using more paper than plastic. Some of the arguments we're going to hear is that paper takes up more uh, room in stock rooms. Totally true. Paper is more expensive to buy. They're about eight, nine cents per bag. It goes to two, three cents. Totally true. They cost, uh, they create more emissions when they get shipped. Totally true. Um, so we don't want to switch to paper from plastic. We want to switch from uh, disposable to reusable. And some of the early research that's been done in places where this has happened, like California, um, we've seen an overall decrease in disposable bag use. It's important. To, it's not just a, like a one-for-one, one, um, you know, paper instead of plastic. There's an overall um, decrease in disposable bag use, which is what we want to see. They also waste taxpayer money, and this is uh, something I've been talking to some of my municipal partners about, and something that really is kind of a hidden problem here. Um, when plastic bags and polystyrene are in recycling loads, they contaminate them. Um, the Rhode Island Resource Recovery has said, uh, has testified in front of the Senate um, Environment Committee that the number one contaminant of recycling loads is plastic bags. They jam up the gears. They are worthless as a um, recycled material um, because they are so thin they can't be made into anything else. Um, these contaminated loads, when they get to the landfill, one of two things happens. They either go through the materials recycling facility, the MRF, and they jam up gears, they cause uh, the workers there to have to shut down the machines, and waste time and waste money. Um, the other thing that happens is they get diverted. So uh, there's a visual inspection of the load, those trucks now get sent to the landfill. When that happens, um, they now pay tipping fees, they pay a fine, and everything that was in that recycling load goes to the landfill, uh, including valuable, voluminous uh, recycled material, plastic bottles, and, so, and things like that. Um, we all know that the landfill is coming to the end of its life probably around 2033. Um, this helps extend the life of that. Um, that's a problem we're all going to have to start facing by reducing the amount of waste that we generate on the front end, that's the only way we're going to be able to extend the life of that landfill. We're going to hear a lot of talk about education, recycling, uh, possibly incineration, which we have a long-standing ban here in Rhode Island on. Uh, those are end-of-pipe solutions, and those are not the way that we're going to solve this problem. Yes, recycling is very important, education outreach, critical to tackling our waste issues, but if we keep generating more and more waste, especially waste that never breaks down, never, never biodegrades, we're going to run out of room really quickly, and that's a huge problem. And so this, what this bill does is it, it tackles a lot of those problems. Um, by then, you know, we've, we've, we've talked up and down about foam, I mean, about bags, I mean, we all know the arguments there. We had this conversation last year. Since we had that conversation, five municipalities in Rhode Island have passed bills banning uh, plastic bags, single-use plastic bags. Um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, large, the, the reason that a statewide push is important is because it gives that regulatory certainty to chain stores and, and other folks. They don't have to have different you know, um, uh, distribution models for different municipalities. It's one thing for the entire state. So we've talked about bags up and down. Um, I want to touch on foam for a minute because that's what this does. I will, I will condense it. Um, uh, Foam is also a, a huge contaminant of recycling loads. It also like bubbling up in all of these, um, uh, you know, all of these samples that we collected. Um, it's not recyclable. Um, foam is polystyrene is recyclable, but this bans food service polystyrene, which is not recyclable um, because it um, it's contaminated with food. Um, also, uh, most most polystyrene has no value um, when it comes to recycling because it's measured in weight, and polystyrene is mostly air. 
And so, um, you know, when we talk about, we're going to probably hear some numbers about the, percent, the percentage of polystyrene as litter, percentage of polystyrene as recycled material. It's done by weight, not by volume or by anything like that. So polystyrene is super light, and so it's going to kind of skew those numbers a little bit. Um, and also, you know, most of, the, most of the solutions that we hear for both bag and foam are these end of solutions. We don't, you know, education average recycling is very important, but we need to make sure that we are um, reducing the amount of single-use plastics, which polystyrene is, um, um, in our, you know, in our, in our waste stream, in our economy, all of that stuff. And so I'll stop there. There's a lot of other things in my written testimony, there's a couple of amendments that, um, you know, um, some language that needs some tweaking, but I'll take any questions that you can me. Questions for Jonathan Burrow. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. All right, uh, Tim.